Hey, gosh, you get to do all that stuff. Do that again? I got to do all that again? <laughs> One, two, three. Good morning, New Hope Fellowship, and you who are there live streaming with us, and later on on YouTube, and welcome. Today is Communion Sunday, and we are going to worship the Lord. That's why we come together, to give Him honor and glory. We're going to be talking about the beauty of unity, and in that beauty of unity, there's going to be honor to the Lord, and that glorifies Him. He loves that when we get together in every part of our lives, and when things happen, well, hey, um, they just happen, but we're going to look at another angle, how to work through those angles where sometimes there's some rough roads with, in relationships with one another, and you can see in your notes, and we'll break those down as we go ahead, but you see those in your notes, all the, you put on the Lord Jesus, you put on these different things, and we see that in those three little verses of Colossians chapter 3, 14 through 17. So you who are watching, grab your Bibles or get your iPhones or iPads, whatever. Colossians chapter 3, 14 through 17, right, you guys? Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Even you at home. Um, this isn't just, we're just doing church. The living God is here. He's here in us. And as we gather together in his name, in fact, there's, a, there's another deep truth out of the book of Hebrews that says he sings with his brethren. And that's a deep thing. Where the Lord, we're made in the image of God, the Amalgo Day. We talked about that a little bit last week. If you heard me last week, we're made in his image. And yet God, when he took on the person of Jesus, his personhood wants to identify with us, the people he created. And so Jesus is going to sing with us, whether it's one or two or 10,000, Jesus, not that he sings to himself, he sings to our Father, which is his Father, but yet he's one with God, just as we're one with him too. So would you bow your hearts with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, you made everything possible through the counsel of, of the Son and the Spirit to come into your creation so personally and specially to love us. What can we say, Lord, but thank you you made us so beautifully and we're so wonderfully made. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in this service. Every part of it, even to the last handshake, when we fellowship downstairs over a cup of coffee and just having some good fun and laughter. Thank you again, Lord, for this morning. In Jesus' name I pray and everyone will say amen. amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you. Beautiful. George, you can cut me off, George, too. Yeah. Open the eyes of my heart. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes.
lift it up. High and lift it up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. creation. Lord of all creation, of water, earth, and sky, heavens are your tabernacle. Glory to the Lord on high. God of wonders. God of wonders beyond our gaze.
Romans 1.20 says, For his invincible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they were without excuse. of heights from the highest of heights to the depths of the sea creations revealing your majesty from the colors of fall to the fragrance creature unique in the song that it sings, all exclaiming, indescribable, uncontainable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by name, you are amazing God, all powerful, untamable, awestruck, I just want to say something about this next song. Well, it's not really about the song, but... So I was looking up the other day as we were going over this song called Famous One. And I'm like, I'm going to look up to see who the most famous person is in the whole world. Who has ever been. And you guys can imagine who that is. So number one, of course, was Jesus. So whether you're a believer, you praise Jesus. Whether you're an unbeliever, you might curse Jesus. But Jesus' name and Jesus himself is the most popular person that had ever lived. And the whole world knows about it, so amen, amen to that. the Lord.
alone are God. You alone are God. You are the Lord. Did you guys get some? Did you get some, Becky? Okay. Praise the Lord. Wasn't that wonderful? There's a song in there I've not heard before. That was pretty cool. I like that. The Lord is always cool. Throughout eternity, He's going to be cool. I mean, it, when you say cool, it's like, man, Lord, how can I describe you? are so cool. You know, <laughs> he really is. Throughout eternity, the angels are going to be saying, "Will you have you seen anything yet, Bobby? Come on. And he's going to be showing all of us his goodness, his glory, his grace. That's what God desires to do. And he says, let us 
make man in our image, and then we're going to just show off to them what we have planned for them. But before that happened, ah, we had a problem. We had a little problem. Wasn't God's perfect perfect will, was never was perfect will, for man to do his own thing. God wanted to have in de- interdependence. Not independence, but interdependence upon him. And so, uh, sorry ladies, but you convinced that man <laughs> to say, hey, we can really look hot and good and we'll have wisdom. And Adam, he loved his bride. Why did he do it? I, the, really, the scriptures doesn't show why he did it. It does say that he, he was willingly walking toward disobedience. But Eve was hoodwinked and deceived. Because Satan is sharp and he's been at it a long time. If he convinced the angels. In fact, the one, one of those songs says, God, he knows, it's scriptural. He knows the number of the stars and he knows them by name. And the Bible says that the stars are actually, angels have an appointment. And even Lucifer had an appointment. But pride, pride goes before a fall. And when you think you're so special, or you have so much, and you put all your marbles in one place or on yourself, you begin to, well, you become become self-centered. And... Eve and Adam became self-centered and they fell. And God, they actually try to cover themselves up because the Bible says they covered themselves up with some type of, of uh, leaf or something. Of course, you see cartoons, you see a fig leaf or something. Fig leaves are pretty big. Anyway, uh, it didn't work. And the first sacrifice God gave was an animal. And he took this... In the sacrifice of those animals, he took a skin and he covered them in their nakedness because they saw that they're naked. Not so much physically, but they just were aware that something's wrong. Subconsciously, we did something wrong. And we find that in our own conscience today. And so actually he asked Adam, what did you do? And Adam says, well, it's the woman's fault. We're going to talk about blaming others later on in the sermon. But what happened was... Then he goes to Eve. And what he actually told, he went right to Eve. He said, what did, what did you do? He said, well, the serpent deceived me. So the Lord went right down the line. He said, well, you know, you're going to have some issues. You're going to, you, I made you male and female. And yes, I want you to procreate and fill the earth still. I have a purpose. But there's going to be some problems in childbirth. And you're going to be always kind of struggling with your husband a little bit of ways. Some commentaries say there's always contention a lot of ways. Not like, oh, she's going to be so submissive. No, there's always contention. There just always is. It just, it's like, can't you just submit, wife? Can't you? No, it's just, it, it's just in all of us, we just want to do our own thing in a lot of ways. But as we learn to be respectful and the husband's willing to lay his life down like Jesus would, you know, then she's going to give that respect. But what happened was then he talked to Adam and he says, you know, you're going to be working your butt off now. It's not going to be coming so easy on the planet. But the next one, he, Jesus. I love that part. We're going to be seeing the Passion this next week, all of us, if you want to. Well, I always love watching the Passion. But there was a place in the movie of the Passion where Jesus is realizing, yes, this is the time why I came to destroy the works of the devil and to lay my life down for the sins of the world. And, and Jesus, there's a lot of, you know, I, I'm not going to get into how Jesus felt. He just said, Lord, if it's your... But you will let this cup pass from me. I've heard different versions. I'm not going to try to confuse anybody. But Jesus just said, Lord, you will be done. And he's struggling in the movie of the Passion that Mel Gibson makes, what I was great, which comes out of the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. When he speaks to the serpent, he says, he says, you are going to, he spoke to the serpent like you screwed up. You're going to bruise this one's heel but he's going to crush your head. And if you remember the movie of the Passion, where Jesus, he's, all of a sudden he just gets these steely eyes, and he looks down, and there's a serpent kind of, and, and in the movie you see Lucifer standing and kind of weaving in the back. How, how many remember that scene? I love that one scene. It's so powerful. And he looks with steely eyes. It's like, this is it. Don't get scared now. 
I like that out of, out of uh, Home Alone, you know, when the guys are, he says, oh, don't get scared now. Jesus looks at and all of a sudden, Gibson shows him crushing the head. When Jesus went to the cross at communion, when Jesus went to the cross, that's what he did. He broke the power of sin and shame and on all of humanity when he went to that cross. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6 that we died with him in Christ and we become new creatures. We rose from, with him. Now, I know that's a deep thing, but the Bible tells that. And what the Bible says is true. All the Bible from the very beginning and the beginning was, was God. And he, and, he, and he created the earth to the very last paragraph in Revelation. And when he went to that cross, he died for us. And we're going to be talking a little bit about later. You're going to see something of love at the passion moment in, in, in the sermon later. I've not seen this before. It's out of love, too, what Jesus does for these 12 guys. One was a traitor, and all of them left him. And I'll just give you a hint. And he still washed their feet. Washed the feet of a traitor. Why? Because he loved. He went to the cross because he knows that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And he was willing to do that for us. He would be willing to die for my life and your life. And that's why we celebrate communion. Not in morbidness, like, oh, he died. No, we should, this is a time of celebration. You died for me and I'm alive forevermore. And that's what Jesus did. He says, when he took that piece of bread, he says, this is my body. And you that are home, if you have some bread or some crackers, it doesn't matter. It's this time of remembering what he has done, this love for you and I. I mean, I've, I, I can say all I want. I'm going to do a, a wedding this week. And it's like, you can say all you want. But I always tell these, these guys, what woman wouldn't want to follow a man if he says to his bride, I will die for you? She would respect him. And if he died, she'd be talking about him all his life. And that's what Jesus did for his bride, you and me. I'm a bride, the bride of Christ. We're the mystical body of Christ. And he died for you and I so that you and I can, when we get to heaven, he's going to show us around. And we're going to see the glory of him all the time. And the angel said, wait till you see this Bobby. I can't wait. I mean, I, no, listen, I, I got a journey just like you. So I'm not, I'm not on a fast track. You never know. You can die tonight. I did a funeral just two days ago. A sister that I used to go to church with at the park in Covina, part of uh, the Agape Church. And she had cancer. Her name was Anita Caban, a friend. Anita, uh, Miriam was a friend of ours. You just don't know. She was 71. You don't know. And yet, for a, a praise report, I got a text message from Juan Rose. There was... Three babies saved Friday. Amen. Saved. When I say saved, friends, they weren't aborted and murdered. They weren't aborted and murdered. And so, but we don't know the journey. These little babies didn't know, and Anita had the long goodbyes. Friends, I'm saying this, that we get to celebrate because we're alive, and if you believe in Him, you'll never die, and if you die, you'll always live. What, a, what an insurance package that is, friends. So if you don't know Jesus, it's up to you. Why not receive him? Why not believe in him? And live your life in the joy of the Lord because, man, this is, just, this is just a taste of what's coming. But until that day comes when we have your life service celebration, <laughs> we're going to keep celebrating the Lord. Amen? And having fun with one another, walking in the unity, the beauty of unity. That's the name of the sermon that we're going to use later. The beauty of unity. One part of my body goofed up. I, I, I'm always checking it like you, right? Don't want no cancer. My body's not in unity. It can happen in a church. It can happen in a marriage. It can happen in a family. God has given us life, and he wants you to celebrate his life in you every day, and we get to celebrate him today, what he's done for us. So would you take your bread? And the night in which Jesus was betrayed, and he knew his betrayer.
He took the bread and he even passed it to the betrayer. I tend to think, maybe, hoping that, of course, God already knew he's Alpha and Omega. He knew what Judas would do. Maybe Judas could have repented, but he didn't. But if you haven't repented and turned to Jesus, what a wonderful time during communion service. And he says, as often as you eat this, remember me. Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus. The gift of life. The bread of life. Jesus, you said you're the bread of life, and yet your life was that life that we can consume in our minds and our spirit and our soul. Lord, we don't have to search no more. Even these little young ones, Lord, if they know Jesus, they don't have to search no more. They just need to take care of themselves, listen to their mom and dads, and, and, and all of us working together because of this love that draws us toward you, Father, and one another. We ask this, Lord, blessing over this element. Friends, eat all of it. In the same manner, he took the cup. This cup represents a new covenant. Some people say, well, we've got to just follow the old covenant. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about in the book of Colossians. Everybody just said, we've well, got to do everything in the Old Testament. Well, we, we follow that by a heart of love. Not that we have to, and we still fall short. But we have a place where God has forgiven us. And the Bible says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And he said, this cup is a new covenant. It's going to, be, it's going to transform your life. Not just drinking this cup but drinking Jesus into your life. We're going to talk about it, as you see in the title of the sermon. You, you put on Jesus. You put him on. He's every part of my life. And I get to see the needs of my wife and others to the best of my ability. I look to him when I mess up. I mess up by hurting people with a few words. Forgive me, you, anyone. We hurt one another with a few, few words. Words hurt. But God understands our brokenness. Oh, forgive one another. We're going to talk about that too. And so with this new covenant, with a heart of love, this is what this new covenant is about. It's a heart of love we want to do unto the Lord. Not that I have to like the law says. If you don't, you must, you should. Now, now it's a kingdom of Lord, I love you, and I want to follow you. And along the way, the Bible says we, we can fall. Not that we want to, but we do, and we get up. I'm sorry to the Lord, to the one you offended with your words. And just pray that they would forgive you. And just enjoy your life every day. Every part of what God has given to you. That's what communion's about. A new life in Christ. And then encouraging everyone. We'll talk about that in a sermon too. Man, maybe this is my sermon. No, it's not really. It's just communion. <laughs> but about how we, we get to tell people. And you, don't have to be a pre, you don't have to do a sermon up here, but you can just share this life as an ambassador. Follow Jesus like I'm following Him. Father, we thank You that, that that night, Your Son, our Savior, He took that cup and He blessed it too like we are asking a blessing on this cup of remembrance that we too, Lord, will more and more and more and more and more and more of you, Lord. Oh God, Father, Spirit, we ask your blessing on this cup. Drink all of it. You know, we haven't done this. It's usually at the end we do this, but can we just stand one more time? I'm going to lead a song, an a cappella, and I need some help. Becky and all the kids over there, well, here we go. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Oh, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. Tell the person next to you, so glad to be here, and you love them. Amen. Hey. Yes, sir, Mike.
<laughs> the bride of Christ is so beautiful. Jesus loves his bride. And that's so wonderful to know that when you're part of the bride of Christ, you begin to look at others differently. Well, before we get into the sermon real quickly and also release some of our kids, uh, and that is uh, this, we have a, a few announcements. Next week is Palm Sunday. We have a special guest speaker next Sunday. But also, too, we have a special presentation with our children who are going to do uh, a special number with Miss Barbara and what's her name again? Nicole. She's been working on this for a long time, and it's part of her senior project in high school, but also, too, we just, she actually finished the project, and she's continued to work with the church. Isn't that a wonderful act of love? To continue saying, my project's over, so see you later. Hasta la vista, guys. No, no. She said, I want to I do this, too. And so this, is, this one really is an act of love. And so um, next Sunday, uh, please uh, view in as well as encourage family and friends to come. And then the following week, wow, it's going to be, we're gonna, it's not going to be a um, sunrise service, but we're going to be out there where the sun has risen in our hearts at St. Nemes Canyon Park. And so you can come live stream and and uh, our friends Greg and George will help us and try to make it look like we did a year or so ago when we were in the park. Some people say they liked it there because people walk on their dogs, they're hearing the gospel, and they're seeing the bride. They, you know, they call it the church, but if you know the Lord, we're the bride. Without spot, wrinkle, or blemish in the eyes of God. Of course, in our eyes, we see like, oh man, they, they, he, she, or pastor needs a lot of work. I know! But in God's eyes, he sees us as his beautiful bride. Isn't that neat? But anyway, so next, uh, this, this coming uh, be the 24th. Yeah, 24th is the 10th. 17th. Okay, I'm sorry, yeah. It's next week. But see, I, I don't have notes. I'm, this is all scripted. Palm Sunday is next week, and then Easter is the 17th. Okay. So... <laughs> Uh, I always need someone like something on my shoulder or ear. George, you should be telling me in my other ear what to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have an Easter egg hunt. You'll see that. So it'll be fun. And um, it will be, we don't have to, if you've never found Jesus, but. He's the best find of all. He's always been looking for you. And also, too, you can give online to WW New Hope Fellowship. No, what is it? How's it go? I don't have a bulletin with me. I'm trying to script this out, right, Lana? <laughs> so anyway, uh, WW. Uh, what was that again, Lana? Come up here. W, okay, who has the, it should be on the bulletin. Anyway, you can give that way, and also, uh, oh, here, there's, here she is. Thank you, Margaret. You can go to second page, the top. See, I don't, I don't, she, on the very top, oh yeah, here we, very top, everybody see that? Website, New Hope Fellowship, sandemus.org, you can, you can put a, a donation in there, your tithe and offering. If you, there are some people that, you know, they just, they're, they're really enjoying uh, joining us online and later on on YouTube. Oh, that's yours, Mark. I'll give it to you later. And anyway, so, and then afterward, uh, you want to, you know, give your tithe and offering cheerfully. You know what? You don't have to give anything, but you know what? You're blessed when you give. The blessed one is the giver. And you think, well, I, I want. Well, I'm not going to get in that, but, but be a giver. And God will bless you abundantly. He will overtake you with his blessings. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, this time of giving, but this time of just, just talking about church fellowship and what you do here as well as at home. Blessings to those that are listening and all those that are here. And those that could not make it today, Lord, we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' love, let me pray and everyone would say, Amen.
Uh, now, the kids are going to be dismissed, and they're going to work on one final roll on, um, on uh, this Palm Sunday. Uh, friends, just for your information, to you that are viewing, we have, every week, God has blessed us with uh, donations from Walmart, and we have all kinds of meats, ice creams, and different things, and this stuff's got to go. I wish you guys could, if, even if you're, you're watching online and you just want to, you want to, uh, you need some groceries or whatever, I need, we need to get Mike's uh, phone number out there, and Mike would come out here. I, I, don't, I don't mind helping him, bringing it in, but I don't like particularly waiting on tables. But I'll wait on tables if I have to. Don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not, it's not above me to do that. But we, we got all kinds of stuff down there. Please feel free to uh, grab some meat and, and just be blessed down there. So, uh, and yeah, go downstairs with the best coffee. Well, actually, the best coffee maker isn't here today because he's on vacation, Bill and Darlene. But I, got, I did the best that I could. So I think you'll still like it. Yeah, you tried it already, Greg? You snuck a cup, huh? No, yeah, okay. <laughs> well, the title of this sermon for you that are, are, are viewing is The Beauty of Unity. And that's out of Colossians chapter 3, uh, just three verses, 14 through 17. And we have four points. And for the, those viewing audiences, uh, I just want to give you those points. And where we, well, let me give you the theme first. By the way, there's a, there's a typo in my theme. It should have a put in there. Uh, that's where my dyslexia came in. I just completely rolled right over it to the teachers that are out there like Sandra and that, uh, Sandra Tienda. So and the theme is this. Believers are encouraged to put on the Lord Jesus in one's life and to walk in love with peace, knowing God's word as the church seeks unity within and sees its benefits in glorifying God. And so here are the points. You have them on your points. Point one, put on the love of perfection. We're going to talk about that. There's some deep stuff in there that which we're going to bring in back the communion. I've not seen this before. It's just, I came across this. I love it. Point two, put on the peace of God to rule your life. Put on the peace of God to rule in your heart, in your life. Point three, put on the word of Christ to dwell in you. And we're going to talk about that, about the word of God. Put on the name of Jesus to serve others in word and deed. And then we always have a little thing that says, let's talk about it, and, and we'll break that down later. But um, how many of you have ever heard of, well, has anybody ever seen a barn put up in one day? No. Have you ever heard of the Amish? The Amish work together in unity and in brotherhood and deep fellowship. They came to, the Amish came to America in about 17... 10 to 1750, and they came into the Pennsylvania area. I've actually, Barbara and I actually seen them when we drove up into New England. We stopped in an Amish community. They, they wear very light blue uh, clothing. Nothing, nothing that would irritate or, or get the, the senses up, like deep reds they would say, or yellow. They wear yellow and light blue and, or white. But they work together, and, the, and they aren't into modern technologies. They still run around in horse and buggy. <laughs> and they know their Bible. They, they know it well. But when there's a need, they come together as a group. And because they still use the animals and they use the farming techniques and they plow their fields, to this day, they work together. And when there's a need to build a barn, the community of brothers and all the women get together for food. And then one day... They can put it up. You can see it on YouTube, put up a, bar, a barn in, in a time uh, crunch, uh, fast forward thing in three minutes. These guys, like about 50 guys are just working like crazy. You know, you see it in, in, the, in, the, in the compressed time lapse thing. And they're putting up this barn from nothing because they're working as a unit because they're like a family. This is, this is our community. And this is what church is about. This is what God so desires. He actually tells us in, in Romans chapter 12 that we are, we're, we're like the, your own physical body. Everybody has a part. And like I said earlier, that friend that, we, that I um, had the privilege to, to celebrate her life and bring the gospel to the family and friends that were there, 
uh, when there's a part of the body that has sickness, like cancer, it, it, it can destroy the body. She's in heaven, and a third of her is here at Oakdale. But just like in any part of our lives, when we don't work with one another, we can destroy one another with a word, like I said, that I've hurt people with my words. I don't want to hurt anybody. I really don't want my heart to be measured out. Not just so I'm measuring him by his words. Well, words are very important. So be careful what your words say to one another. and Let them be gracious and full of mercy. So uh, anyway, we so desire to have that unity that God would have. Just like this, these Amish people. They work together in a unity that God so desired. And um, what happens is, is because there's a unity that this love, it's a, it's a beautiful place where it holds us together and love is the beauty of the believer dis- dispelling the ugly sins of the flesh that destroys unity sin destroys unity we see that in all areas of our life it's like oh man that hurts and can't we just i like using rodney kings i've used that so many times over the many years can't we just get along you know instead of burning everything down because you know of our skin color or our words, let's work together. We can find a place of agreement and unity and respect without tearing down our society or, or our families and stuff like that. Individually, we're to, as the Bible says, put off the old man. We, we use those terms. We used those a few weeks ago, but we put off this old man. What's the old man? Where there's jealousy, uh, uh, unforgiveness, uh, envy, you know, lying, and different things. That's a, the, the world says, what's wrong with that? In fact, there's a society in New Guinea that uh, when it came to the Lord's Supper, this is this just come to my mind, but a guy named of, um, uh, Richardson, he witnessed to the New Guineans uh, in uh, Papua New Guinea, and they thought that Judas was a hero because of how he deceived Jesus, because that's what they do in their society. Because they thought... Uh, you know, that he was strong to do that because that's what they did. They were in New Guinea. You, you, uh, uh, what's his? Richardson. Anyway, um, the name of the book is called Peace Child. If you wanted to write that down, Google it yourself. But that was what they thought, that Judas was, he was special because he could deceive even Jesus. And that's how they did it. And they, by the way, the, the New Guineans... Uh, I'm not sure if that's the right, New Guineans or New Gu- they're from New Guinea, Papua New Guinea, that, of course, they were cannibals. They're no longer. That we, have a, we have great four square churches in New Guinea, Papua New Guinea. Uh, great churches. And they love the Lord. And they have their culture. We don't try to break their culture com- completely, but we want to get in the culture of putting on Jesus and walking in love, not in deception, and to destroy somebody and their family. But what we have here is that uh, Paul is talking about, he wants us to put on the new man, and that's what we're going to break down. So before we go any further and read this portion of Scripture, would you bow your hearts with me and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your goodness, Lord. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Speak to me. Help us all, Lord, as we put you on, Jesus, and put on love, and, and let peace have its way, and Lord, all these beautiful things, Lord, of your word that guides us into the beauty of unity. I ask this, Holy Spirit, in the precious name of our Savior and Lord, to you, Father, in his name we pray, amen. So if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to um, Colossians chapter 3, just three verses. We're going to try to break that down, and actually, uh, if you were to go above that, uh, Paul begins to talk about uh, your beloved, put on tender mercies, this mercies, kindness, all this stuff, and bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against e- even Christ, forgave you, so forgive others. And then he goes into verse 14. And above it all, as that we're going to be looking at, putting on love, love of perfection. And he says this, but above all these things, above mercy, kindness, humility, da-da-da-da, you know, forgiving. He says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called in one body, 
and be thankful. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Isn't that wonderful? To, to have a place. God, God's speaking to the church and He's wanting us to, to begin to, to see that you're part of this community. The part of the community of unity that brings beauty and said, what, well, didn't that feel good? We just, we just put up this barn together. We just helped this brother. In fact, I'm thinking of a couple brothers that are sitting here that the body of Christ, we got together when they were in great need and beautified their, their new home. That was a special time. A special time, and I know that they appreciate it. We, and by the way, we really got the biggest blessing. Why? Because we got to do the giving. They, it's fun to be the receiver. But it's important that, that we continue to walk in that, that realm of, of giving and, uh, and not just saying, well, I'm, you know, I, I need to receive. Love is so important. You know, a lot of us, we write people off because they've hurt us. But because the Lord has changed our heart, we become to be servants and great servants. It's the love of Jesus that changed us. It's the love of Jesus that changed me. May 25th, 1971. I didn't think anybody loved me. The only one person I thought that would even be willing to hang with me would be my future wife. I didn't know that she would be, but she just, uh, uh, you're just going through another phase. But I felt like it, I lost all love until I found Jesus. And you know what? With a stutter and however you look in the mirror, because a lot of us have those feelings. We look in the mirror and going, oh, I just don't like what I see. So what do we do? We do what we can to help it. All of us do. I mean, can you imagine if I came to church in my T-shirt, my, I didn't comb my hair, I just rolled out of bed? I certainly wear my underwear up here, but what that looked like, you, weren't, you wouldn't be looking right. <laughs> you know, but we, we put on the best we can. But putting on Jesus, this love is so important. And so we embrace, and this is something here, we need to embrace those who's hurt us. Those whom we cannot get along with. Whoa. That's hard. To embrace others that we can't get along with. Jesus did the most unthinkable act at the Last Supper. And wait till you see this. It wasn't His duty to do it. You've got to hear this. It shouldn't be Him doing this. Since the tax... The, the, the task was for the, a lowly servant. Only lowly servants did this, or slaves. Jesus took off his good looking sweater like this, <laughs> and he tied it around his waist, took some towels, and began to wash 12 dirty feet. One of them was a traitor. He knew the traitor was amongst them. He did that. But here's something I just came across. Only one pair of those dozen feet stayed with him at the garden. Wait till you hear this. Eleven of them ran. One of them wasn't one of the apostles, but his name was Mark. He left his clothes. But one of his apostles stayed there with him. Guess who stayed with him? Judas. Judas stayed with him. He was agreeing with the soldiers. He's the one. Get him. He kissed him, and his feet didn't run. And later, the conscience of, of Judas, later on, I mean, when you, when, just like Adam and Eve, when you sin, you just, there's something, I did something wrong, and now why are they taking him? He didn't expect them to crucify him. They just, let's, Jesus is off the chart. He's off the chart. By the way, Judas was a he was he was greedy and was a thief too, the Bible tells us. But he Jesus still had hope for Judas. And that one pair of feet stayed with Jesus, didn't van him. But all the others did. That's something. It should have been this that Jesus washed all the disciples' feet except the feet of Judas. But no. She's, no, no. I'm, I'm going to wash just the 11, but I know, I know who you are. I really know who you are. Oh, Jesus, come on, guys. 
And then Peter, of course, says, don't do this to me. Don't wash my feet. We should be washing you. And if you do wash me, wash every part of me. Wash my head. I, I mean, I want all of you, Jesus. Of course, Judas, Jesus, Peter didn't know that a few hours later he's going to deny him three times. And Jesus says, you know, stop it, Peter. Don't be so religious. He didn't say that. That was me. Uh, but he said, I'm just, your feet is just good enough. Your feet's just good enough. You know, Jesus said this in Luke chapter 6, 35. This is heavy. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be the Son of the Most High. Because He's kind. You'll be like the Son of the Most High. Because the Son of God is, is kind to the ungrateful, the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Jesus offers us grace even today. Grace is unmerited favor. It depends on you. I mean, you... I do like sharing this, and, and every theologian that I would know, or you would know, or any commentary, that you are a, a person of free choice. You don't have to serve the Lord. You don't have to do anything. You can go through your whole life journey and be 109, or 101, or 80, or 70. You don't have to serve Him, but one day you will know the Lord, that He is the Creator, and He names the stars by name. He knows them by name. And if he knows the star, he Bible goes, breaks it down. He knows how many hairs you have in your head. He even knows how many hairs you lost. <laughs> you know, so he's, he, this is a God who loves us and wants every part of us. He's merciful, kind, gracious, and loving. And he wants us to do that as well. Of all the men in the room, only one was worthy to have their feet washed. And do you know who that was? Jesus. Of all the people in that room, the only one really worthy to have his feet washed. By the way, in Revelation it talks about his feet. When John, the beloved, one of the, the ones who says, I, I, who's the traitor? He put his, his head on his chest. And he says, Jesus, because Pete says, hey, John, you're close. Hey, who's, tra who's the traitor? Well, kill him now. No, that's me again. And, and Jesus he just said, I'm the one who's going to dip the, the bread and the, and, the, and the wine. He's one. So he did it. Judas did it. They still didn't get it. Jesus, in the book of Revelation, he speaks to John. His feet are, there, there's a glory about the Lord. Jesus' eyes are shining like, like fire. His hair is like, like golden wool or whatever. It's like wool in his, I mean, he just, Jesus is lit up like no one could ever, Describe. And John did the best he could, but his feet were like bronze, just shining like gold, brass. And so, yeah, the only one that really was in that room that deserved to be, have their feet washed in deep humility would be Jesus. And by the way, I, I love this part too. There was a woman, by the way, the first, people say women can't preach and they shouldn't be preaching and all this, whatever. You know, I, I, really, I really would, I don't want to argue but the first preachers of the gospel was Martha and his mother Mary and others. He's risen. He's alive. Oh, you can't say that to the guys. There are some churches that are very deep in the Well, we got the scripture here. Friends, there are some great women of God throughout all the whole testament, throughout all of history. And by the way, you even had Joan of Arc that was murdered because, you know, how dare she speak, not let a man talk. I'm sorry, I challenge that. And I have Scripture to prove it. They have Scripture too, but you know what? Is it worth it? No, let's just keep worshiping Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's what the important thing is. So, anyway, is, is at this place where, where uh, these women begin to preach and to share. Uh, the gospel of Jesus is proclaimed. And, uh, and we need to just you know, honor one another, even in that place where the Lord desires us to serve one another. But there is this one woman in the, in the Gospels, and I love this, it's one of the most beautiful, where she, I don't know, it wasn't Mary Magdalene, but it was the other Mary, Martha's sister, Lazarus' sister. And she's seen what Jesus has did. I think it was, I think this might be after Lazarus' resurrection, I'm not quite sure, but it was Mary, and she came in, and she began to anoint his feet and dry 
his feet with her, her hair. And someone started, one of the guys, how dare this woman do that? And Jesus says, she who is forgiven much loveth much. And he's in King James. And she dried his feet. He says, I came in. You didn't clean my feet. But ever since I came in, she took, the, she took her glory. The Bible says that the, the woman's hair is in her glory. Everybody read that? Is in her hair because they beautify. And she took her hair. I don't have much hair. But, you know, she did this. Oh, Jesus. Try to get whatever I have back there. And <laughs> she did that. She did that. And, she, and Jesus, he didn't. Stop it, woman! But the men, how dare this woman? That's, I, we got some great women preachers in this church. We do. Because they speak from the heart and they know the word of God. Not stand them up to any man and think, that, oh, they shouldn't be up there. Friends, when the anointing's there, the anointing's there. There's a great woman by the name of Amy Simple McPherson, and she said, the reason I'm up here when there's such persecution on the women, and there's always been, she said, because a man didn't step in that place. And you know what? We're four square because of that woman, and there's great churches around the world because of a woman would step out, even in the midst where she had problems in her marriage. He didn't want to follow the Lord. Now, he knew the Lord, but I'm not going to go down that track with you, Amy. Amy said, well, I, have a, I have a groom, and I'm going to follow Jesus. And she did. She worked so hard in her life at four, age of 44 and up in uh, Oakland, California, and trying, and, and, and then again, she wasn't perfect. You can follow her story. But she died of, of not on purpose of notice, just taking like a, like a la, not laxative, but uh, medication to help her sleep. And for some reason, her heart stopped. There was close to five to 10,000 people over in, in, uh, in a Forest Lawn in, in Glendale. I wonder if you ever want to go to see her graveside. It's just awesome. But yes, can ladies preach? Yeah, because God has changed their lives. And this woman, she... She said, Jesus, look what you've done for my life. And this love, Jesus says, yes, I'll take that one. You could wash my feet, Mary. You know, if someone has fallen and done wrong, can we help them learn from the errors of their way? Well, if they get hurt or they hurt others or hurt you, Jesus gives us the, the prescription to do. Matthew 18, 15, go to that person. Hey, and we have this in family. We have it in the church. My brother, I'm sorry. My sister, I'm sorry. My wife, I'm sorry. My husband, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to hurt you. But what does pride do? I'm not going to. Not me. They're, they're the one. Humility has never hurt anybody. But pride has gone before a great fall. How love works. Love them back to God. Love them back into His ways. Release our grievances through forgiveness, and change them, how? Through love. Max Lucado said this, relationships don't thrive because the guilty are punished, but because the innocent are merciful. Isn't that cool? Let me read that again. Max Lucado, great author. Relationships don't thrive because the guilty are punished, but because the innocent are merciful. Here's what Samuel, Jackson, or Samuel Johnson said in the 18th century, a British author. He said this, the true measure of of a man is how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. Wow. You've got to hear that again. True, the true measure of a man or a person is how he treats someone who can do him absolutely no good. We, we treat one another and help them. By the way, we're to be built, bridge builders. The strong ones are to build the bridges. Not the weak ones. The weak ones, I'm not going to say nothing. The one who is innocent is the one who makes the gestures. The one who is innocent. In other words, he's the strong one. He's going to make the bridges. You take the step. That's hard to do. And so we continue to put on the Lord. We put on the peace of God that rules in your heart because we can do this with love because the peace of God's in our heart. 
Now, you're still going to have people against you. We do. And it's like, how can they not love a face like this, like yours, right? But, they, you know, it's like you look at them wrong. It's like, I'm reading them. I know exactly how they think. It's like, there's other voices that, that tempted Eve and Adam and then passed on to us. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is good, whatever is, is of good report, think on these things. The enemy wants us to think raw and mean of others. Be gracious and good and kind. And as Christians, we've already made our peace with God. How? We believe in Jesus. That's the peace that passed on. We, Lord, come into my life, and all of a sudden we just know that something has happened. This peace is necessary because if without it, we still are in our separation of sin. There's a separation. Sin separates us. Sin, what's sin? Sin is it's, it's selfishness. We just get away from God, and, well, it's just about me and mine. And, and it, next thing you know, it's like, why are we fighting? But Isaiah says this, your sins have separated you from your God, Isaiah 59, 2. It's in the Old Testament. And then, of course, we have the New Testament. God asks us, not preachers. See, that's the part I do like to say. I, I don't believe in that, re that religion, that it's just the preacher or the teacher that they have all the answers. Well, if, the, if you aren't reading your Bible, then you need a, someone, and we'll see that in a minute, a, a teacher and a preacher to kind of encourage you to go in the way that they went. And that is to become more aware of the Word of God, and that He has called you for such a time as this to be an ambassador, a minister of reconciliation where God has reconciled the world on the cross, starting, and He's given you this ministry of reconciliation almost to the place as 1 Corinthians chap, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, 5, 20 through 21, almost begging people to come to Jesus or back to Jesus. I, when I did this funeral over at Oakdale, yeah, I, I, I'd give a message. If you don't know Jesus, he loves you. And yes, turn to him. Re, repent. You, you made mistakes. Call upon him with your whole heart and ask him in. But there are also two, and I use this because a lot of them I know are believers. This is maybe you're, we use the term backslidden. We backslide. Oh, I, he didn't answer my prayers. Or the pastor didn't do it right. And, and this church only judges. And they're not friendly. And. Man, who's speaking that nonsense? No, maybe it's a little bit of truth there, but it's not the whole truth because their perception is wrong. And so what happens is, is we begin to separate and we begin to slide away from this beauty of unity. The beauty of unity. I mean, marriage is like that too. I mean, the husband, I read a book, Husbands, Do Yourself a Favor, Love Your Wives. By goodness. That book tore into us like we were a stepchild, the men. Because the women, they're just, a, you're to submit, you're to do what I say. If I ever said that to Barbara, we'd have been gone a long time ago, separated. It just don't work. But some guys think they got the Bible and say, it works. The Bible says, submit yourself. It, no. You lay your life down. And by the way, when you're dead, she's willing to submit then. No, no, really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> you, by the way, you can remarry. But then again, are you sure? Because the first round didn't go too well either. But, um, but there again, if he's, if he's kind like Jesus, merciful and gracious, I mean, yes, sure, okay. What do you want to do? Well, what do you want to do? And it's just, that's the way God has intended marriage. Not if you want to see what God is really upset in marriage. Look at Malachi chapter 2. Because the men, they become, it says that they're harsh. Man, we don't need to be harsh. By the way, weakness, meekness is not weakness. It's just power under control. You know, we, we're, in fact, the Bible does say that, that the Bible does say that the, the feminine side of the women, there, there's a, there is a, a, a weakness about it, but yet there, there, there's a strength in them too. And so we should not look at that because physically they're weak, but man, they really are quite strong. In fact, psychology says this. I mean, science says this, that when we were formed in our mother's womb, the male, the testosterone split the, the left and right hemisphere, and we men are predominantly left 
hemisphere thinkers. And women, when they were, when they were young girls, were, they were born, there wasn't a split. There's not a testosterone breach. So, man, they, you, women like to talk. I mean, I just, and they like to shop. And <laughs> what would I go on that? Anyway, but, uh, you know, they, but they're quick. But they can be vulnerable too. And we as men lovingly, graciously work both sides of the aisle of, of the life of peace and love. And so we walk with this security that we have. And, and so when we do, and, and just before Philippians 4.8, it says this, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ. There's a peace that's so wonderful. Peace is that referee that helps us make choices. When you're upset, it's, it's really hard to make choices. When I'm not right with my wife or with the Lord, my choices are going to be skewed. And so I want that peace, amen? To have the peace of God. They'll pass my understanding. With, and with my kids or my grandkids, when things are going wrong and they're not jumping through, through it right or whatever, it's just like, I just don't have that peace. God wants us to be in that peace because it brings this beauty of the unity that God has intended within the family unit, within the church he, that he's part of. It's the, by the way, this has never been... I don't like when people say, this is Pastor Bob's church. Don't say that. It's Jesus' church. I'm just a, a sheepdog. I bark, and I need to be careful when I bark because I don't want to hurt anybody with my bite. <laughs> but because it's come on back, and, and all of a sudden, you hurt people. Let's put on the Word of Christ to dwell in us. In verse 16, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. Let it, that, that word let... Let it. No, no, I don't have time for the Bible. Let the Word dwell in you. I don't have time. I got my job. I get up early, and then I come home. I'm wiped out. Friends, one of the things I've learned as a young man coming into the kingdom, and I never read the Bible until I was 19, but like we were saying in our men's study, if you haven't been to our men's study, any one of you guys, come. It's awesome. Everybody gets a teacher. Greg's our facilitator, and he does a lot of background work. But when I started reading the Word, and we looked at that, that we're John, one of the brothers, bringing up about, well, it looks like it's all inscripted in the parables. And I, I looked at that inscription. It's kind of like that I mentioned last week, these things you see at the fair, and it's all inscripted. But if you keep staring, you see the, the dolphins moving. Have you ever seen those at the fair? Just look. I love it. I, in fact, I went online trying to find it. I need to get one of those and put it downstairs. Just keep looking. Let the Word of God, just keep letting the Word of God enrich you. And that's what God wants you to do, to see these beautiful things. And as a young man, I began to just like, wow. I didn't know. I mean, it wasn't hard to read. I read the King James Bible. and just, I can't read that. It has these and those. Are you kidding me? When you're hungry, you understand it. If you're not hungry, I don't care if Jesus is here. Who's he? But when you're hungry, you begin to understand because of the Spirit of God going, I got a, I got a live fish. A live fish is, Jesus says, I want you to become fishers of men. I got a few friends in here that love fishing. I do too. But nothing's more exciting than when you share Jesus. And like, going, what? What did you say? I got to share Jesus yesterday at a little three-year-old birthday party. And this lady was Catholic, and I got to share with her what Jesus has done. She's Catholic. And I'm through my line of, Jesus done this for my life. And she's listening. And, and she said, do you have a card? I said, yeah, I got a card. She lives in Rancho. We were talking about the traffic that's out here. But I got to go fishing yesterday for men. She's, a, when I say men, generically a person. And it was because, man, he, he's done everything in my life, and he could do everything in your life too if you let him. He, you, if Jesus were to be here preaching, and he wouldn't declare himself, and he would look like a homeless guy, but he was just homeless, you'd probably say, why did the pastor let him come up here? His words are kind of interesting. I'm catching in and out. But when your heart's hungry, even the King James Bible becomes alive. And whatever you read, it would be awesome. And so... We, we allow and we let the Word of God dwell in us. God's revelation is brought into the world through the Word of God. The Word was spoken and He, he just it, he, hung the, he hung the 
world on nothing. He just spoke it and it was there. You read it in the book of Hebrews. It says that we believe that God called the world into existence. In the book of Hebrews. And of course, as Christians, we do this. But, but the world would say, no, we came from a slime pit. And somehow it all just gathered together and we became an amoeba of something. Green slime. But you know what? The Bible can even contend with it scientifically as well. It really can. Even to the creation with the Big Bang. I'm not going to get into that. Maybe one of these days I ought to give a series why I, where I'm standing on, on how it all happened. Because well, how can the dinosaurs are millions of years old in, in six days? Maybe I'll do that. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? That would be kind of interesting. I'd like to do that. So my grandson, a few... Uh, Months ago, called me on that. I said, what, what about this? And so I got to unload a little bit of, of what I learned in some graduate studies. I was the only student on this one class on uh, creation of Genesis. And I, and I had just three units to pick up to get my Master's of Divinity. So I thought, I'm going to have all these students in there because we're doing online. And Dr. Leonard, I'm thinking, okay, cool. And, and so the, the school said, okay, he needs three, three units. I took that, and I was the only one in the class. You can't hide. You can't hide. You know, when you got, you know, a half a dozen people or a dozen, it's like, oh, yeah, let them do it. If you ever been online, you ever been online, you have all these friends in there, it's like, uh, my mind was a little weird. When you're the only weird one throughout the whole class, it's kind of, you know. So anyway, but we, we, we admonish one another to, to learn the word, and, and, and when we study it, we apply it, and we're, then we get to live it. We get to live it. I don't want to be religious. I don't want religion. I want to apply the word of God and let it richly indwell my life. It helps me in every part of my life. And one day, you know, I'm going to have a, a life celebration. I won't be there. You know, maybe another pandemic and you won't have people there. Sadly, we have loved ones that have gone on, and, but we celebrate them in our hearts. Amen? We celebrate them in our hearts because we know that they're doing well, and God will help us if we, we go through our journey. But let the Word of God dwell in our hearts because what it does, we begin to live it out. We, we begin to have a unity. We begin to know how the, how the barn goes up. We begin to know our part. Look at that, the Amish. They put it up in one day, and, and they collapse it in a quick lapse, and these guys are working, 50 guys, in one day putting a barn up. You know, when we work together and everybody has their part in a church, it's like, it's like well, I have, it's my part. I, I need to be the lead. I need to be the teacher. I need to be the preacher. Whoa. I need to be the worship leader. Thank you, Danielle and girls. Beautiful. I don't have that gift. I tried. I lost my job. No, <laughs> but I'm teasing at Covita. But for four years, every week, I did what Bam would do without CDs. But God wants us to apply and study the Word of God. So let's put off the old man. What isn't pleasing to God, we want to give Him glory. Putting off the lying, the jealousy, the, the envy, the, the position players. I just need a following. I got all these people. Look at my texts. I got 20 of them. And they're all calling me. They call me pastor. Do you pastor church? No, but they call me pastor. Be careful. Let's put on the Lord Jesus and serve others in word and deed. And like I said earlier, our words can hurt. The ultimate goal of any single life is church body. What's the good for the whole church? Not just one person. Well, we go to this church because we like this pastor. We like that. No, we come because God, I want to be used by you. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, it says this, whether whatever you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do all for His glory. Do it for Him. I'm going to do it unto you, Lord. And, and you know, we, we want to help one another too. But we love the Lord. Lord, I love you. When you love somebody, you don't want to hurt them. In every, any part of your life, you don't want to hurt them. You know, but no, I got my schooling, I got to do I got a job. My marriage is more important. I, I'm in this volunteer group over here. I serve here. But we, it's all about me, myself, and I. We, you can read that for yourself in Romans chapter 16, the last part of our apostles. Be careful of these people that are just so 
enamored with themselves. But let's put on the glory of God first and foremost in our personal lives and in the corporate life. Let's build the body of Christ. Coming together like the Amish in a unity. It's so wonderful. I mean, you've got to see that. It's like, wow. And God will use us. And in so doing, we give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to God, the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, who's in you. By the way, you know, and I always like to say this. Well, well we, and the, like I said, I love the worship. But Jesus didn't turn up because the music got turned up. No, He came in because you came in. He's in you. Christ in you, that hope of glory when we see Him. He's in you now. That's the beauty. He's in us now. And that's what we get. And so in closing, friends, you know, you've heard that chorus that we sang, What a Mighty God We Serve. Well, you know, we're going to try to sing that one more time. We won't have them come up, but it's such an easy chorus. I would like you, if you would, to stand with me, and we're going to sing about this mighty God we serve, we love, and give glory to. So you know this song. It's an old chorus. As we begin, you at home, what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Angels bow before Him. Heaven and earth adore Him. What a mighty God we serve. And as you stand, amen. You know, you at home, if you don't serve the Lord and you don't know Him, it's, it's simple. You sinned, and we all are sinners. But if you've never repented and turned to Jesus, He has forgiven you. But call upon His name from your heart. Ask Him in, and you'll have Jesus. And then those who are backslidden, and you need the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry. I'm back, Lord. I love you. Thank you, Father, for this morning. Thank you for those that are listening. Thank you, Lord, as we continue to build up one another like those Amish did. Building a barn. Even though it seemed like it was a dirty place where, where life was in, you, Lord, didn't think it so disrespectful to be born in a dirty barn on the ground where poo-poo was. You, Lord, came for me and everyone on this planet. Have your way in my life. Continue, Holy Spirit. Thank you and for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. And it says, Amen. Amen. We'll see you downstairs. Amen.